are talking on the scintillating subject of avoiding more government regulation, um, which of course is um, a, a lot of words. Um, and what we have here is an expert, <laughs> not me, um, we have an expert on how we're going to really avoid more government regulation. Um, there have been some announcements of, uh, from this morning, I think, Glenn, that's right. And uh, Glenn's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, from TCR's point of view, I mean, obviously what we do is we work very closely with the carriers. Uh, we work closely with uh, all of the stakeholders within TCR, which includes the, the DCAs, the Direct Connect Aggregators, and the CSPs. And we try and just have a very inclusive environment where we're talking about what we can do to make the ecosystem better and ensure that we're creating compliance and we're creating regulations that are within, the, within our own ecosystem without having to go outside to people, um, uh, other government bodies. And Glenn, if I want to turn over to you at this point and start talking about exactly what we've had come up of late and some of the recent regulations that, or the recent notifications we've had from the FCC. Great, Thank, thanks Steph, hopefully this is on. Um, I think a third of the people left when uh, Dario said there was a lawyer in the room, and I apologize for that personally. Um, I was a little worried about folks remembering what I said, but I think for the most part, most of you are probably just staring at Steph's shirt for the next 30 minutes. And if you don't see them, you do need to see these shoes. Um, I think I'm at a RuPaul special at this point rather than an industry conference. Um, <clears throat> so. They're normal shoes. They're not normal shoes. All right. Um, I'm Glenn Richards. I want to thank MEF for having me, and I want to thank my good friends at, at Campaign Registry for including me today. Um, I am a partner at Pillsbury. I'm, I work out of the Washington, D.C. office. Um, I've been practicing communications law for 37 years, um, and to show you how old I am, I think the first matter I worked on had to do with whether the city of New York should remove its New York telephone payphones. Um, and replace them with the newly available customer-owned coin phones. So that goes back 37 years. I suspect about half this room doesn't know what a payphone is. Um, I know most people that I talk to don't. But I think Steph mentioned, and I don't want to be the buzzkill, but unfortunately we heard a lot of very positive vibes from Ajit this morning. And Ajit was a really, he was a, it was a monumental figure. He was really very much market-oriented and did a lot of wonderful things. And I know TJ was not his best friend regarding the net neutrality decision. That was a very controversial decision. And originally they brought me up here to sort of provide a counterpoint to Ajit, but we only have 30 minutes, so I don't have enough time to do that. But um, I do want to read something, and I generally don't like to just read at these things, but literally an hour ago the FCC released a document that probably should perk folks up a little bit because Ajit mentioned the effort that they did with the Twilio decision, which was somewhat monumental. He basically decided uh, Twilio went in, and I, I know we have someone from Twilio here, but um, <laughs> sorry. Um, Twilio came in and, and wanted the FCC to actually declare for its own purposes that, that text messaging was a telecommunication service because they wanted the FCC to actually exert more control over the ecosystem. I mean, I think a lot of people don't remember the history, but you know, when you've, we, we participated in that docket and um, the FCC basically took a 180 on what Twilio asked and, and found something the opposite, which was that text messaging, text messaging was an information service, which basically is a light touch regulatory approach, which Ajit referred to. However, about uh, a year and a half ago, the text messaging world unfortunately became somewhat under the kind of the microscope of the regulators and started with some um, innocent correspondence from the Hill basically saying we're getting, uh, we're getting worried about this. We're, we're hearing more from our constituents um, about abuses in the text space and that always is never a good thing. And so there's some letters were sent from the, um, from the Hill to the new chair of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, as you know, we've had an administration change. Um, and, and in my world, whenever you go from R to D to D to R to R to D, you know, you're sort of always trying to manage those industry changes and the, and the policy perspectives. So about a year ago, uh, Chair Rosenworcel mentioned she was about to start a texting proceeding, 
which would have been the first of its kind um, since Ajit's decision, uh, finding that text was an information service. And they put that, there was, they blasted out some headlines literally in October of 2021. So we've been all sort of sitting and waiting, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? I was gonna just talk about how we can continue to sort of stay out of the regulatory kind of crosshairs of the FCC. The bad news is, is the FCC released this morning, 11, that document that we were expecting 11 months ago. And I'm not gonna read all of it, it's 22 pages, but I do think it's probably worth reading a paragraph and then I'm gonna go into my sort of more prepared remarks about maybe where we should think about going with this, but it's a notice of proposed rulemaking, which in and of itself is problematic because the FCC has uh, two choices when it releases these things. It can do things as a notice of inquiry, which is asking lots of questions. The problem with an NPRM, it sort of, it sort of projects that the FCC maybe has made some decisions about this because under the Administrative Procedures Act, you actually have to issue proposed rules that get comments before you can adopt new rules. So had they issued this as an NOI, I would be less worried about it because it would probably take years to kind of run its course. The fact that it's an NPRM means that there's uh, possibly some preconceived decisions that have already been made. So I'm gonna read this real quick, it's only a paragraph. In this notice of proposed rulemaking, we propose to require mobile wireless providers to block illegal text messages, building on our ongoing work to stop illegal and unwanted robocalls. Specifically, we propose to require mobile wireless providers to block texts at the network level that purport to be from invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers and are not on a do not originate list. We also seek comment on the extent to which spoofing is a problem with regard to text messaging today and whether there are measures the commission can take to encourage providers to identify and block text that appear to come from spoofed numbers. In addition, we seek comment on applying caller ID authentication standards to text messaging. All right, so, Regardless of where you are in the ecosystem, that's kind of where we're at. That is sort of where the playing field is now that the FCC is considering. Um, I bring a lot of experience from the robocall perspective. I do a lot of work on the voice side. And I think, you know, I'm gonna try to be somewhat um, objective here. I, you know, I'm not sort of, I'm more of a mercenary than an ideologue uh, for in my world. And I think that what we need to think about is, depending on where you are in the ecosystem, and if you're, you're the carriers here, the question really becomes, and this is becoming a problem on the robocall side, how much discretion you want to be able to block things that you think are illegal. And in the text messaging world, illegal is kind of an odd term. It's the same problem in the voice world, which is there are lots of calls we get that may be unwanted. There are lots of calls we get that may be illegal. Anything that is obviously attempting to defraud or has an intent to defraud is generally illegal. And I think all of us, hopefully in this room, would agree that nobody wants to get a text saying your account has been frozen, right? Click this link, call this number. And I think what's, what is generating this, the FCC put out a report, if you haven't seen it, you may want to look at that along with the NPRM I just read. But this came out on August 30th and it sort of stated the market of text messaging. And I think there's probably one or two facts that are in here that are probably, you know, a, maybe a bit of a black mark on the industry. I mean, for a long time, I think we've sort of stayed out of the regulatory crosshairs, but I thought the mo one, of the, one of the facts was basically from 2019 to 2021, the number of complaints that were sent to the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission regarding text messaging had tripled. And that's how, you get, that's how you get in the regulatory crosshairs, right? People complain. The other way you get into the regulatory crosshairs is, and I, I think Ajit sort of mentioned it in his comments, were that the concern is you've got competitive issues where competitors are saying, these guys are doing something bad, you need to regulate them, or these guys are new and disruptive, and we do what they do, you regulate us, you need to regulate them. And so the question really becomes, I think, for all of us is, you know, how is this ecosystem different than the voice ecosystem? Because the voice ecosystem, the FCC, Congress have, have there's been a number of new rules and regulations 
that have been uh, adopted in order to stop robocalls. And frankly, if you haven't received a robocall, you don't own a phone, right? The reality is at this point is that we need to sort of figure out how to do that. And to the extent that it's available, they've done this thing called stir shaken. And I think it may have been mentioned earlier. It's basically a call authentication process where each provider that is handing off a call in the ecosystem is supposed to make sure that there's a check mark on that call that the originating provider who sent it to you basically said, I know who that is, I know that phone number, I assign that phone number, that's my customer, check mark. We're, we're that, that is the whole prospect. And we've heard at least 10 times today the word trust. We've heard the phrase know your customer, and those have become sort of prevalent terms in the voice world. And I think to the speakers that recognize, and I think Warren did a great job of, of pointing that out, nothing is more important than, than know your customer. And in what's happening in the voice world is to the extent that you're, you're familiar with it is the concept called traceback. And what traceback is, it's the industry has gotten together and it's basically said, we're gonna, co we're gonna cooperate to figure out who the bad actors are. And to the extent that you are part of the problem in the ecosystem and you're the one that either originates or that is part of, the, of handing off of those calls that are bringing them into the United States are part of the origination of those calls. We want you to be proactive in basically taking down that traffic. And so three things are happening in the voice world that are, that are very important and that could be you know, pre-signaled here in this NPRM. One, if you, I've been doing this, it, if you would have told me 10 years ago that the FCC would ever give telecommunications carriers the right to block traffic, I would have said you're crazy. The entire communications system, which is built, built on you know, in the 1500s, the ideas of common carriers, common carriers were basically supposed to get you from point A to point B. They weren't supposed to look at the content. They weren't supposed to do anything with respect to getting. All they were, they were the transport. And if you think of the, the carrier, the carriages that took you from you know, within England, those were the first common carriers. And telecom regulation was built on the idea that, frankly, if those carriers disrupted that communication, they were violating the Communications Act. The problem is, is that with the problem with robocalls is how the hell do we stop this unless the carriers participate in this process? And so I think what we're seeing now is this discretion that has been handed to the carriers to basically decide they are the arbiters to decide what is illegal, what is unwanted, and should they have the ability to block phone calls? You know, I'm not here to sort of, you know, kind of put into your minds whether that's a good thing. If you're a carrier, you might even have doubts about whether you want those responsibilities because with those responsibilities become problems because if you make wrong decisions about the type of traffic that you've blocked, you damn well better be in a position to redress that because you're gonna have a lot of angry people within the ecosystem that are really upset that those calls are not getting from point A to point B. And those calls, even though they may appear to look like robocalls, those may be calls that are, hey, your school's closed because of a storm. Hey, there's an active shooter in a, in a mall. We need to notify people. Those are short duration calls to a lot of people that may go out over you know, an automated system that may look like robocalls. And so the last thing, I think we would all agree, we don't want those blocked. So we've got this dichotomy of, I think everyone would agree, I don't want to get called from the Microsoft Service Center telling me my, you know, my computer has been hacked. I don't want the auto warranty call, but I damn well want to know when my doctor needs to change my appointment, when my kid's school got closed, and I think we're seeing this sort of push and pull, which is making things complicated in the ecosystem. I think it's important, too, that folks keep in mind that to the extent that the carriers are going to get this um, additional you know, authority to block text messages, what we did in the voice side to make sure that there, there were opportunities for redress. And so to the extent carriers made decisions and said this call is a problem or this, this is an issue, we think this person is responsible, then they needed to be prepared to have a redress system in place so that people could complain and say, listen, we are not a robocaller. We're sending you know, messages from doctors to schools. 
we need to get this cleared up because our calls are being blocked. And I think as an industry, we need to do that. I think the other thing that we need to do, again, looking proactively, I think Ajit addressed this, this industry has sort of stayed out of the FCC. And I think it's important that you can't, to the extent that, you know, Ajit is right, those, those people work hard, they care, they think they're doing the right thing. But I, you know, what I do know too is they're not always real world. And you guys need to get in there, you need to explain to them how this ecosystem works, where the, where the tensions are, what we think people should do and not do. The CTIA has done a great job, I think, in terms of keeping the FCC, you know, five feet away from, from the industry. The messaging guidelines, the security guidelines, I think this ecosystem is very different than the voice world where there could be thousands and thousands of VoIP providers that are responsible for bringing calls in, for terminating calls. I think there are probably more uh, toll bridges and gateways here where, where the choke points could stop. But I think it's incumbent upon this industry to basically decide, as it's done in the voice world for traceback, that once we've identified bad actors, once we've identified the, the sources of origination of bad text messaging, you better damn well shut those people down. And the industry better talk to each other so that the bad guys can't show up on someone else's network tomorrow. Because the problem is, in the voice world, it's been a bit like whack-a-mole. So the traceback group figures out where the origination point is, carrier dutifully shuts somebody down, and then because you know it's easy to get phone numbers, it's easy to make voice calls, next week they're with somebody else. And so I think this industry, to, to do itself a favor, needs to figure out how it's gonna solve that problem and whether those bad actors are US-based. The other problem that we're finding in the voice world is a lot of these folks are just, they're outside of the US jurisdiction. The, the US government can only do so much about call centers in Pakistan or India, and you know, not to pick on those countries, but I think everyone agrees that that's where the source of a lot of the issues are. Unless those governments are willing to work with the US government to shut down the bad actors, they're gonna find a home for those bad phone calls. As long as there's profit to be made on these, as long as 1% of the people are duped by those calls, as long as there are VoIP providers that are making .0003 cents on all of those phone calls, there's always gonna be an economic incentive for people to keep doing this, right? And until law enforcement working together internationally sort of stops the problem, there's always gonna be this fraud. And you know, again, I, I kinda go back to those complaints. Why are complaints going up? It's because more people are relying on text messaging. The bad actors have realized people aren't answering their phones anymore because there's no more trust, right? I get, I get so many phone calls every day. And frankly, the, from my perspective, having now worked from home, now going back to the office and we've got this office app, I'm getting more robocalls on my office phone number now than I do at home. And you know, my, my, my cell carrier does a good job when I tell it to block things. But you know, I wanna answer phone calls. I'm a lawyer, I'm in a service business. I don't know everybody that calls me, but it is incredible that the number of robocalls, despite industry's best effort, is still in the billions every year. So I think, you know, to the extent you want the regulators off your back, industry itself has gotta figure out ways to solve this. And I think, frankly, you know, we've got an opportunity here, so the process is, is that this, this, S, this new FCC proceeding will go out, will be published in the Federal Register, comments will be due to be filed 30 days after that. If your industry cares, you need to participate in that process. You don't wanna be left out. Um, and because at that point, the, you know, the FCC will then you know, take in all the comments, there'll be reply comments, people will then have meetings, and, and I'll be honest with you, you know, and again, if my carrier friends that are here, I do a lot of work with the carriers, they're my clients, but they've got an upper hand here, right? And to the extent that you're worried that the carrier community is gonna not get the ear, you know, they are the lobbyists, they're in there all the time, they're taking these people to lunches, they're at their, conf you know, the industry conferences. You've got a bit of an up, if, if you think that the carriers may be you know, sort of angling this in a way that, that is beneficial to them versus your apps and your piece of the ecosystem, you better damn well get in there loud and clear because you know that they've got the advantage. I mean, that is their, that is their home field. And to the extent that you guys have successfully avoided that for the last number of years because, you know, of what Ajit did, you know, five years ago and everybody has stayed out of the text messaging space, I think it's important that 
you guys realize that that's, that is now the field you need to be fighting in. I think the other area that's interesting to the extent that you're CTIA members, CTIA is going to have this, you know, inherent conflict, right? You guys are the messaging part of that, your members or supplier members. Well, they represent the carriers. And ultimately, they will do what the carriers want them to do. And again, the best answer would be let's get those decisions aligned so that we work together as opposed to someone seeing it as a competitive advantage for one party or another. So um, again, hate to be the buzzkill. Um, and hopefully you didn't listen to me and you just stared at Steph's shirt and his shoes for the last 30 minutes. Um, but I think we have a few minutes for we do. questions if people want to do that. So. Should have worn my glasses. So. Um, I think the best way if you're anti-government is if we're going to do this campaign registry, there's fair, consistent pricing. I know, and there's fair and consistent, you know, throttling, right? So these things change every five, you know, every few weeks. So if you're going to do self-regulation, we need to do it well and fair and consistent um, because as a provider, we try to communicate this to our customers to build trust and so forth, and it's very difficult uh, when it's changing consistently. So I don't, when, you, when you say changing self-regulation changing, who, whose prices are we talking about? I'm, I'm uh, little... Let's just take T-Mobile's charge for okay. $50 for a setup fee and Verizon and AT&T don't. Uh, they're charging, you know, a third of a cent of a quarter of a cent. So and you're talking about the carriers. The I just carriers. wanted to yeah, make yeah, sure yeah, I, the I, carriers. I knew. Yeah, oh, and, and I, right. I get you guys, are just, but, but, but if they right. want self-regulation, they don't want FCC involvement, then they need to set up their game and set up the, right. the, so it's fair because not only do these costs are tripling the cost of the text messaging because if you look at these SMBs, most of them are eating this cost because they're not, they're not. If I've written some doctor's office software, I don't know how much Doctor Feinstein sent versus Doctor Lowenstein sent, and one may send 500 messages, one may 50,000, and my costs are through the roof, and I have to eat that. So, and, so, and we haven't even hit that. Not only from blocking, we have to deal with this from a from a, a who's paying for this. So I, th I think, um, I don't want to be the bearer of more bad news, for at least for that answer, but the FCC doesn't regulate the pricing of mobile services. I mean, the Congress decided in the 1990s that this was going to be a competitive market. The FCC, um, for years, is basically, unlike the, the voice side of the world, um, the, the landline side of the world that, um, that I originally came from, Congress basically said, you know, we want this to be a robustly competitive industry, and the FCC, for... And, and frankly, from a federal perspective, the FCC doesn't regulate anybody's rates anymore. Unless, unless you are providing inmate phone services and access services, the FCC has gotten out of the business of rate regulation. So I don't want to, you know, the industry can do what they want. I mean, the, the, I think the theory is, is that competition is going to set rates in those markets. And to the extent that, you know, T-Mobile is doing something bad, hopefully Verizon or AT&T won't. But the reality is, is that I don't, I, w I wouldn't count on the FCC doing anything with respect to carrier rates. Yeah. But that still doesn't address the problem. So you're going to have to pay T-Mobile, right? Because if you're an ADP provider, oh, well, your customers are on T-Mobile. You don't even know that. Right. Agreed. You know? Yeah. Uh, I was just looking at this NPRM. Uh, it looks like stir shaking is coming to text messaging. Is that the general gist of this? Uh, and if that's a short answer, follow up. What about uh, labeling on calls, on voice? Uh, there's no, there's nothing to do, there's no appeals process or anything? I mean, from where you sit, do you think? Actually, there it? is. So to the extent that you are um, talking, so stir shaken, I think hopefully most folks know, it's basically this authentication process where the originating carrier, as I mentioned before, basically says, I know my customer, I gave them the phone number. If one of those two things is not true, then you don't get the A is a attestation is the highest level. B is um, I know the customer. I didn't assign the phone number. C is I'm passing the call. I don't really know anything about it. Um, the issue that, that that he's at he's raising is periodically we will get some notice on our phones that says spam likely unknown number, particularly if it's somebody who's not in your phone book. Um, there are two answers to that. One is depending on if that if that spam likely notification is coming from the um, carriers, it's one issue. 
but there are also third-party apps that you may be, um, that your customers or end users can adopt. Umail is a famous one. There's a handful of third-party apps that we can download on our phones that are supposed to do some of this screening for you. If your carriers are doing it, and if you're sending phone calls or text messages that are being mislabeled as spam, the carriers are required, and, and there are links, and, and I can, you can talk to me afterwards, They're through US Telecom, they, they, they actually have a list of contacts that you should be able to go to directly, or your carrier that is your originating provider should be able to get, go to, per, to proactively to get that changed. But they are supposed to have a redress mechanism in place to uh, fix any wrongfully blocked calls or wrongfully labeled calls. I know there's redress for blocking, but I thought the FCC order four in 2021 said there was gonna be no redress for labeling because they wanted the carriers and people to work it out. And but but there, is, out. there is a process. Okay. I mean, I think if you work with, if you've got a, a, um, a carrier or an aggregator or somebody that is working in your corner, they should be able to help you fix this issue. I'll I mean, say RoboKiller expanded their text message blocking just today to put out a PR, uh, press release on it, so they're gonna be blocking text messages, and you mail and RoboKiller send back, if y'all don't know this, that's why it's so scary, fake disconnected tones as soon as you're labeled, and so then you get back your disconnected tones from the field, they're actually, you mail send back the fake ones, so it's like a data integrity issue on the calling provider side, but. Any other, sir? Uh, on RoboCalling, um, I, I, and still shaking, I have not seen any decrease of robocalling I received this last year, so I'm not really sure how the FCC and carriers are measuring success on this, but uh, it's not perceptible, at least from my point of view. Um, assuming it worked, assuming the calls originating domestically were all blocked properly, um, then the next step will be to, to have uh, robocalls coming from international numbers. And the solution there will be to enforce uh, steer shaking internationally, which is not possible, realistic, cost efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So w what is your view on wh what's going to happen with uh, whether it's voice or SMS? W what's the real solution of steer shaking? It's not effectively working, and it will not prevent uh, robocallings from international numbers. So the, the, there is an effort to expand the steer shaking framework to other countries. And I'm aware that Canada specifically has adopted it. I'm aware that Indonesia, France, and at least two or three other countries are looking at um, using stir shake and the, that framework to originate calls from those countries. I am also aware that Microsoft, Twilio, and others are working together to create basically an international version of a stir shake that would help authenticate originating calls because obviously if you're a Microsoft, you, you're, you know, you've got your teams packages that are calls are originating from all over the world. So there, there are efforts in order to, to get to that issue. The other issue that the FCC has done is it's basically forcing international carriers that are providing services within the US and that, that are originating traffic to register in what's known as their robocall mitigation database and file robocall mitigation plans and putting more burdens on them to block calls and to take, take some initiative to know those customers and participate in the process. You made a great point in the very beginning, which is I'm not sure any of us have seen um, even a blip in the number of robocalls that we're getting. Honestly, I think the only way you solve that problem goes back to what I said earlier, which is you gotta put the bad guys away, right? At some point there needs to, you can't, the, the, if the industry can't solve this because there's too much technology that makes it easy to send messages or to send phone calls, until you start putting people away and actually closing those call centers, I, I think it's just gonna be impossible. The, the bad guys are really smart. They understand the technology as well as everybody in this room. And I think it's difficult until you start making sort of some statements and that, that re requires international cooperation. And as long as people can find profit in it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change. The problem I'm worried about is the overblocking which is now lots of legitimate calls and text messages not getting through. And the first time that happens, that a 911 message or some other, Ajit mentioned 988. Can you just imagine these types of things being blocked when somebody's trying to text like a, you know, a, a suicide hotline? And, and so you know, that, that's when the rubber hits the road from the other perspective, when, bat, when, when important calls or text messages don't go through. And the commission's gonna have to grapple with that, and the carriers, and everyone in this room's gonna have to grapple with that. 
Sure, and it's a statement slash question. So I'm uh, Ryan Tullis, and I work with Tullis, a uh, Canadian carrier. And uh, first thing on the stir shaking comment, uh, not that I'm an expert in it, but uh, it's a labeling uh, protocol, not a blocking protocol. So, so the, it really doesn't, um, we haven't been seeing, and I'll, I would also say the implementation of stir shaking has been challenged across the world, <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't have the mechanism to block. That's up to the applications that receive the labeling within stir shaking. So I, I wanted to clarify that, but I did have a question for you internationally because we're also struggling to have stir shaking pass across the border um, and whether or not stir shaking is too complicated for messaging verification um, labeling because I, I think it might be. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to answer that from a technical perspective, whether the text messaging right. technology yeah. sort of lends itself to stir shaken. I, I don't know whether you're aware, though, the Canadian STIGA, which is sort of implement, is now part of the U.S. process. And so I participate, uh, one of my clients is on the board of STIGA. So the last meeting that they had, actually the Canadians, the Canadian participants actually spoke about the efforts to try to bridge the gap to make sure that, you know, calls can get authenticated. Your point about the, the labeling is 100% is accurate. This is not a blocking tool, but where I think the authentication becomes important is that, you know, in addition to carrier analytics and third-party analytics, the stir shaken um, authentication could be part of what goes into the machine learning and analytics to decide whether carriers should or should not block a text message or a phone call. So it's, it's just another piece to the puzzle along with other characteristics of the types of calls that are that are coming in. So I think we're seeing, at least at the U.S.-Canadian, not un, um, not surprisingly, more cooperation to make that work across border. But you know, as we've said, you know, it's a big world, and I don't know how everybody else gets on board. Okay, so, so over to Stefan. Um, Glenn, uh, just one thing. Um, I know that with oh, the voice. Oh, you're supposed to talk too. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry. I, I was I was merely a colourful sidekick. That's <laughs> the only reason I was up here. <laughs> no, just very quickly. Um, I mean, obviously, the big thing with, between voice, stir shaken, and messaging is that in the stir shaken world, the traceback doesn't go all the way back to the brand, whereas in messaging, it does. Um, and so we actually have a little bit of one upmanship in that respect where we really do know where it's originating from. Um, so, given that, final statement from me, which is the only thing I'm going to say. <laughs> I want to thank Glenn for coming up and really um, ensuring that we know everything that's going on up to date uh, as it hit the press. Uh, I want to thank you all for staying awake and for um, not staring at me too much. And uh, I think, is there a break now, Dario? Um, yes, we do. And I'll, um, but we, we are very late, but we, we have a break. But no, we're not breaking to thank you with a big applause for okay. all you've been doing. Thanks. <laughs>